Hello, my name is Michael O'Keefe, a.k.a. The Movie List. If you enjoyed this interview and want to hear more top-notch film industry conversations, please press the thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and hit the bell to stay in the know. All right. Hello, ARL, Anthony Hales, and Sam Casterly. Before we talk about your movie, They're Outside, tell me how coronavirus has affected your day-to-day -day life. I'll let Sam begin. Well, we pretty much don't leave, our, don't leave your home for pretty much the entire week. You can just mm -hmm. pop out to the shop. But <laughs> we're pretty much living virtually every day. So I, don't, I, I spend most of my time on video chat meetings with everybody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit like a, it's a bit like living in a horror film, to be honest. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, we, we were very lucky. We we actually were in a, Sam and I were in Jamaica doing a, a documentary in Je was that January or February? February. That was February, yeah. February, and we there was no uh, problem with the COVID really that had become too widespread. So a lot of lockdown has been editing that that Jamaican documentary and doing some screenwriting. So it's actually been a very productive time, but I do miss going to some of the rock clubs in Camden Town. That you know mm -hmm. that whole group vibe of being out with your friends in a kind of club bar we miss mm -hmm. that that's good fun well that's good stuff speaking about uh feeling like a horror movie uh please tell me why you think horror audiences will enjoy their outside i think that with their outside if you're a fan of found footage um some people mm -hmm. aren't by the way and i i understand that they, they, they mm -hmm. don't get on well with the shaky cam um but i think it can be a very direct medium where it can really put you there with the characters and be very much um, uh, frighteningly alive and in the moment. So I think, I think audiences will like the pagan vibes of it. I've always liked films like The Wicker Man. I think we, we, we look to evoke something so we, of that. Yeah, we, we could. Although we are found, it's a found footage film, but we've shot it documentary style. So we're not having the kind of, you know, we're not using GoPros and webcams and things like that. We're using proper high production values on it. Yeah. And we've got some great actors in it as well. So we've got um, Emily Booth, who is a cult horror icon in, in the UK. She's done lots of kind of um, independent horror movies and TV presenting in the UK. And also got... Yeah, they love, I mean, they love Emily and they love Nicholas Vince, who, who's in Hellraiser. They, these are real mm -hmm. UK darlings of the industry. And the performances, I mean, you, you've seen the film, I think our leading lady, Chrissy Randall, who might jump on and say hi if you wanted to on the call a bit later. And uh, Tom, oh, wow. our psych, you know, psychologist, quite a young guy to be a psychologist, but he's kind <laughs> of like a YouTuber. Um, I think their performances are really great. And when I see horror movies, I'm really looking to, uh, to the actors and to believe in their character and what they're trying to achieve. So I think that we have been very blessed in the actors that we've worked with. And I think people will enjoy watching those performances. Yeah, I mean, especially Tom. He's our main character, Tom, who plays Max Spencer. He's making a documentary about an agoraphobic woman, and he's trying to help her leave the house within 10 days, but there's a haunting outside keeping her in. So, yeah, we talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, the haunting green, uh, green eyes, uh, it can't give too much away, but we certainly give that away, that there is, in, in this town of Hastings, the town I'm actually from originally, so a seaside town called Hastings, and I love that place. And the Jack and the Green Festival in the film is a, is a real life event that goes on. It didn't happen this year because of COVID, which uh, broke my heart, but it will be back next year. But yeah, obviously he goes there in the month of May where this May-based ghost is meant to come knocking on doors. And it would seem that it comes looking for Max and it kind of all unravels from there. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a hell of a script, and I was wondering, was this script sort of outlined and then expanded? I would love to learn more about uh, the writing process for this film. Yeah, sure. I mean, with, with the yeah, it, there was a lot of planning, and I, I mentioned somewhere else that it's um, it began as a drama and not as found footage, and it didn't really work. I knew that the idea of the agoraphobic woman, uh, her agoraphobia linking to supernatural reasons rather than psychological reasons. And the psychiatrist taking that on would be an interesting premise. But as a drama, it just wasn't playing. So when it became found footage, it really did come alive. You know, suddenly turning up with the camera, the character of Sarah, the acrophobic lady, her distaste of the camera and of the girlfriend of the leading man, because she, she to some extent fancies this YouTube guy that's coming to try and help her. Those dynamics suddenly came to life in a really unique way. Um, it was planned a lot though, yeah, I, I believe in scrawling an absolute ton of notes and then 
gradually chipping away to get to the final thing. And we shot a lot more than you see. We actually shot a 120 minutes of film and yes. cut it wow. down. So, yeah. Cut it down by about 40, uh, 40 <coughs> minutes of it. Which was great. You know, that's a real luxury. And we don't don't suggest that. We're doing a new film <laughs> right soon where we're just shooting the script pretty much. It won't be shooting anything above that. But it was a good uh, thing to be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's. I I like lean horror movies. It yes, g- generally works out. What are some of your favorite lean horror movies? What 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 would you say is a really lean horror movie? Oh, like off the top of my head. Well, I mean, uh, just in terms of like lean in general, I've been I've been um really lately uh, uh well lately I just finished watching the the Arrow video box set for Shina Sukumoto. Great. Um, okay. The yeah. Solid Metal Nightmares. Uh, you know, Tets, wow. yeah, Tetsuo the Iron Man. Uh, and, that's a uh, crazy film. Yeah. That's, a, that's a crazy <laughs> movie, and that's just an hour. Of that movie, that's like that's super lean, but it's so chaotic. Uh, <laughs> base uh, and like he never goes over ninety minutes or an, or a uh, hundred minutes. So, some of them are, some of his projects are like forty minutes or like fifty minutes or 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 eighty minutes usually, and you know, especially when it's something cerebral. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or you're really going on, on a bumpy ride. I, I just feel, um, you know, sometimes less is more. I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think there's a roller coaster ride, and after a while, people get used to the roller coaster. So you can't really mm-hmm. keep them on there too long. A movie like Midsummer, you can because it's, mm-hmm. um, it's more. It goes into drama a bit more. And I think that uh, when you see TV horror, I, I love what they're doing in horror on TV. But part of the, the thing that, that is perhaps trickier is the fact that it becomes. Uh, drama over a series of episodes something like the haunting of hill house is fantastic but that that hour and a half roller coaster ride mm-hmm. in something like hostel or, or anything you know mm-hmm. in changing those older 80s movies seem to be an hour and a half that is a great time length. completely agree and i think we come in at 82 minutes 80, so. uh, 83, 83 or, minutes right great. okay that's good yeah imagine the hostel is a three-hour movie yeah, Hostel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That would be a hard three-hour film to watch. Yeah, you'd get a headache. Yeah, a home after that. <laughs> you, you, I feel like you'd probably puke. Um, <laughs> one thing um, I, I love looking at, just for, for aesthetic reasons, I love looking at uh, uh, the weird, you know, paranormal things on YouTube. Just their sort of p- paranoid aesthetic. And I was wondering, was was that a visual inspiration for this projects yes uh we did look at some i mean i don't believe in ghosts but i love those mm. videos on youtube there was one russian woman in the woods with a, a daughter uh, you you may have seen this video it's probably on creepy pasta or something like that mm. really creepy video where this russian lady is in the woods and her daughter appears to fly up towards a tree and i really like that kind of unnerving uncanny sensibility of a youtube video that you know has probably been faked but maybe not it's just really messes mm-hmm. with your head and i've seen some that are just shitty like you know i think we put it in the film where door handles are kind of just yeah. turning and you go well someone's around the other side of the door but mm-hmm. then there's others where napkins in a mcdonald's seem to triangle up into the air and float up and you go oh wow what's that mm-hmm. so there is something there i don't believe in ghosts but i love those videos i think they're really creepy late at night to watch definitely <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or just like, uh, just because this is like sort of shaky, shaky cam as well. And uh, yeah, I love, I love videos on like reptilian humanoids and weird, <laughs> yeah, weird we're, stuff we're like that. Reptilian humanoids. So you're talking to two reptilian humanoids. Yeah, we're right? <laughs> both a thousand years old. Come out of the use. Well, yeah, David Ike is British, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Okay, do you lean more into research on uh, occult a beliefs for a movie like this, or do you get more inspired by other movies on the topic? A bit of both. I mm. say the research is great because the when you look at Sussex folklore, because any you, folklore... Because you grew up in, in Hastings. Yeah, growing up in Hastings with mm. Jack and the Green. We, we actually made, I don't want to even say this actually, but I will say it. So we mm-hmm. made up the Green Eyes thing, but some people that I spoke to in Sussex said, oh, I know about the Green Eyes legend. Mm-hmm. So it feels like something that should be a thing. And we're trying wow. to make it obviously so, so people actually think, oh yeah, that was the, the thing, you know. Because mm-hmm. when you do that, it becomes so much creepier. And I think that there's a lot of crossover with urban legends, and yeah. what we think we believe. I mean, I don't know if we, Surrey, Surrey in London is too many no, urban legends. No, so I'm from an area that's just outside of, outside London, it's kind of the suburbs of London. There's more, 
there's more golf courses here than golf <laughs> <laughs> homes. Wow. So there's more land dedicated to golf courses than actual homes. <laughs> but uh, there's not nothing like that here. I mean, we went down to Hastings for the day. We went around all the little shops, uh, with all the people selling little pop It's an crafts. amazing community um, of pagans and other beliefs. Yeah, we're learning a lot about their beliefs in, in sort of the Wicca theories and paganism. It's just, you see the festival in the film, Michael, and I think the thing is that growing up as a kid and turning up at that day where in the film you see that there's the parade and the people are dressed in green and Jack in the green, and there's a kind of sacrifice moment where he's lowered, which you see in the film. And I love the symbolism because the idea of um, the Jack in the green is it's the birth of summer. But there is a brutality to it in that when they pull the Jack in the green down, this uh, big statue, the guy inside has to get out of it and they kind of rip the leaves from it, tear it to pieces to release the summer. Now this is a ritual, uh, is kind of akin to a lot of the stuff you see in things like the Wicker Man with the, uh, the maypole and everything. It just all kind of fits in. I, I'm fascinated by old Mayday customs and old kind of pagan beliefs. I think they're fascinating, yeah. They really are. I read uh, The Demonologist, that's uh, Ed, Ed uh, Warren's uh, memoirs, you know, the, the Amityville okay, horror yes. guy. And, uh, of course, The Conjuring 2 takes place in England. But uh, in his book, he says, England and Oman are the places with the most ghost stories. Oman, okay. Yeah. I don't know in Oman, I had no idea. Well, yeah. That's great. I'm actually going to write, write that down. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Oman next time. Oman, yeah. Well, I mean... Well, I, I did you guys see that movie Personal Shopper with Kristen Stewart? Yeah, yes. Where did she go at the end? Oman. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. That was a pretty good I, film. That was an interesting one. Very good film. Very good film. I love that. That's like a textbook example that like texting in a movie can work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, as long as the audience aren't texting themselves. Right. <laughs> I agree with that. So how did you two come together to make this movie? Uh, so we, we did a, a film directing course at... Ages ago. Ages ago, 2011. 2011. Uh, there's a course, there's a film festival in London called Raindance, which is the, their rea the UK reaction to the Sundance Film Festival. Oh. And they were running kind of film directing courses uh, in your evenings. And we, just, we both kind of just bumped into each other. Talked about horror. We love horror yeah. and we, we love Fright Fest. So the film's playing at mm -hmm. Fright Fest and we're so excited because uh, it's a shame it's not live because the party atmosphere of that event is incredible. Um, but we love that, go to that every year. And we're massive horror fans and we just knew that we had a shorthand with what we like in, in scary movies, which is basically great performances, trying to do creepy visuals and having a, a clear narrative that yeah. surprises people if, if you can get that, you know, that's what we're always after. And yeah, we watch a load of, you know, uh, a load of horror. <laughs> yeah, kind of we, do, of it, we yeah. do this kind of like retro fest um, some weekends where we watch really old 80s movies, yes. uh, a lot of trauma movies, uh, a lot of 70s slashers, uh, just all the good stuff. Do you guys like giallos? Yes, oh, of yeah. course. Love oh, giallos. Nice. We, yeah, we met, um, we met Dario Gento last year. He was at Fright oh, Fest. What? Uh, we got to meet him at uh, a book signing. Yeah, he Dario was great. great. He's That's amazing. pretty amazing. Uh, what was he like? Ah, uh, great guy. Right? He was great, really nice. Mm. Um, so it was a, he was doing a book signing at Fright Fest last year, and like even all the kind of the you know all the big filmmakers were even queuing up to go meet him at the day say or he was really kind, really nice. Um, they wouldn't, you know, they didn't want you to spend too much time with him, but it was mm. like a, little, a little conversation with each other. Uh, yeah, uh, Dario's visual style is is just. Oh, I love the music. I mean, well. Inferno and Suspiria, mm. I like it when he adds a flavor of the supernatural. So the straight up mm. jello is obviously great. Deep red is, is fantastic. But the mm. um, Suspiria and Inferno, when you put the ingredient of the supernatural in for those two films, uh, the opening of Suspiria, the first five minutes is probably the best oh, yeah. thing in, in horror cinema. It just mm -hmm. grabs you. It's like a roller, it's like a thought part. The roller coaster that just fires you off like a bullet is, is what that, if we're talking about roller coasters, that is oh, what. Yeah any of that movie does it's amazing mm -hmm. yeah i read his book that book uh fear his oh, memoirs yeah. it was good lots of fun and i also picked up um i love suspiria and, and i think inferno doesn't get enough love for I sure agree. uh it's so vibey it's not it's not that roller coaster ride but the the like the texture of that film is so rich and i recently um somehow i lost it but i was reading suspiria de profundis by thomas de quincy 
That oh, was wow. like the, the book that Daria Nicolota discovered uh, 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 to, uh, that's like when the research started getting really good. And they talk about the three mothers. And do you guys want to know where the three mothers come from? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was an opium dream that he had. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. He was a guy, he was a British guy in the 19th century. And one night on opium, he, the three mothers came to him in a dream and he wrote it down. That's and fantastic. Then, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty great. <laughs> Amazing. So, so, so we, we, we touched on um, the music in Dario Argento, so that's a good segue to the next question. Please tell me about the music in this movie and the tone you were going for. So Sasha Blank is our amazing music uh, composer. Mm -hmm. And we wanted a fairy tale. So when the film begins with Nicholas Vince as the professor of folklore, the music there and around the film in Green Man Day and some of the other bits, is supposed to invoke the kind of green man fairy tale, the, the, uh, the green eyes story. And we wanted the sensibility of when Max goes to the house, he's already part of the story. And when Emily Booth begins the film by saying, I, I don't want to be in the story anymore, which isn't a spoiler because it's in the trailer, uh, she, she's, everyone's in a kind of story. And we're trying to cross the idea of where, where you suddenly enter a narrative. I think green eyes kind of envelopes you in his dark fairy tale when you don't believe in it, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so we wanted a, you know, fairy tale music, really, uh, but but with a uh, yeah fantasy edge, of course. So that, that whole fantasy fairy tale thing. Nice, I like it. Well, guys, thanks, thank you so much for your time. One more question: uh, What what when can people see there outside? So you can see it at the Friday Fresh Digital Edition, which is our films on the 29th of September. Of, mm -hmm. Sorry. 29th. We'll get that right. 29th of August. August. Nice yeah. and clear. Um, 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. GMT. Um, so you can go to fightfest.co.uk to get tickets. Um, yeah. Ours is on the Saturday of the, of the event. And we want to hear from people. We want everyone talking about folk horror. We love folk horror. And we want and, a lot more of it. And what's the best case scenario? Do you guys want an Arrow video Blu-ray? Yes, that would be the best. We, oh, Arrow. I mean, VHS was such a great thing, and it feels like with Arrow, you've got that, that, that cover yeah. art and all the mm. extras that weren't even there with VHS. Want, yeah, of course we, wanted, we would love that. We want to yeah. turn disc edition, you know, <laughs> you know power common uh, uh, featurettes. It's so amazing, <laughs> those, those movies from Arrow. I think the best Arrow DVD, I mean, you'll know this, Michael. What, what's your mm. favorite Arrow? They're all so great. The, the oh. Inferno one is pretty good, by the way, as you know. We know the Inferno was uh, is owned by Blue Underground in North America. Oh, okay. okay. There's a, an so Arrow the, Inferno here. Yeah, yeah we it's it, there's there's a little uh, there's some things we get from Arrow in uh, Canada and some things we don't. But I would say I'm a big fan of uh, the Herschel Gordon Lewis box set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's all right. That's the the reprint the of uh, Love Feast. Yeah. Love Feast. So Blood Feast. <laughs> <laughs> Night of the Living Dead maybe is the best, like, you know, first, like, good yes. DUI horror movie, but uh, Blood Feast is still the first one. <laughs> it's yeah. the first horror film, wasn't it? Yeah. We've got a few labels, actually. We've got 88 films that put out mm -hmm. some really great stuff, like Intruder, the... the uh, Sa uh, who did Evil Dead? Uh, Sam obviously Rain. Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi, did yeah. He, he did that film, and that was so mm. much fun. And you got Shameless. Shameless are great. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> all the stuff that nobody wants to touch and sort of more gruesome stuff like Cannibal Holocaust oh, uh, the New York Ripper really god underground stuff but yeah they're, they're great Shameless those three labels 88 films Shameless and Arrow are just a dream the films that you know come out all year mm -hmm. round and they've unearthed it and you saw it back in the 80s and you just get that feeling again mm. of going into the video shop but you get more because they're going to give you mm. like a 50 disc set with a comment <laughs> from the gaffer. I love it, whatever it is, like, wow, fantastic. Thank you, Arrow. We well, I it. hope their outside gets an Arrow video Blu-ray. That would be my best case scenario. Thank you. Yes, All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>